If you have your Bible this morning, turn to Acts chapter 28. Acts chapter 28. And we're continuing our series on the fruit of the Spirit. So if you're counting, there are nine fruit of the Spirit. Kindness is that one right in the middle. We've to the fifth week of our nine-week series, and I wonder if it's an accident that kindness is the center of the fruit of the Spirit. I don't know. We, we'll let you decide whether that's important or not. I, I want to kind of review where we've been. We've looked at love, joy, peace, and patience. This morning we're looking at kindness. How many of you all have taken time to turn to Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, and try to commit that verse, those verses to memory? Anybody in here get an opportunity to do that? Every week we get a few more hands. We have less hands than usual. Be proud if you've memorized some scripture this morning. If you've memorized Galatians 5, 22 through 23, put your hand up proudly. Okay, well, you guys aren't nearly as proud as I am. I, it took me a while to memorize these verses. Let's read these two verses together. Galatians 5, 22 through 23. They're up on the screen. Can we read them out loud together? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The law is not against such things. So here are our nine fruit of the Spirit. We looked at love being a concern for others that is expressed in action in abundance. It's something we do. It's an action. We looked at joy as accepting the circumstances as God's blessing and then expressing gratitude. Again, there's an action involved. When we looked at peace, we said it was to seek harmony by focusing on God's plan and sacrificing ourselves. Again, it's not that we receive peace, it's that we make peace. And last week, we said we bear patience when we accept God's timing while seeking God's will. None of these fruit are, are things done to us as believers. Instead, they are actions that we should be doing. They make us active. And so if we thought for just a moment that we would have patience simply because we've trusted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we have found ourselves to be impatient. If we thought that we would naturally be more joyful just because we have accepted Christ, we find ourselves at times feeling down in the dumps. But when we look at the fruit of the Spirit and understand that they are not done to us, but instead they are actions that we are to do for others, we see them in a whole new light. So this morning as we look at kindness, I want to start off by telling the story of, uh, of a 68-year-old security officer. The 68-year-old security officer uh, had had her job for a long time. Uh, her name was uh, Elise Holdren, and she got fired from her position as a security officer. Now you may wonder, why did poor little 68-year-old Elise get fired. It wasn't because she was too old to be a security officer. It wasn't because she was weak and frail and fragile and unable to do the job. No, she held her position uh, for years and years, but she was fired in 2010 because she was too courteous. This is what her superiors wrote. Due to your caring and giving nature, you are compromising your position as a security officer. Being caring and giving is not a job requirement, nor is it what you are paid to do. And with that, Miss Elise was fired. Can you imagine being fired from your job because you are too nice? Being fired because it's not what you're paid to do. Can I tell you this morning, most of us have been on the other end of things. We probably deserve to be fired because we were not kind and compassionate enough. Being kind is something that comes naturally to some people, and others really struggle with this, this kindness fruit. Of course, we're taught from a young age we have to be kind to everyone, be nice to everyone. But you know, there are some people it's just hard to be nice to. Yesterday, I had the privilege, oh, the, the joy, bearing my fruit of joy to go to Walmart on a Saturday morning. It was just a pleasant experience all around. I got to practice all sorts of fruit of the Spirit. I got to practice patience. I got to fight to accept the joy that God had given me for people. And I got to stand in line behind some of the slowest people that have ever moved in Robinson. In those moments, even as kind-hearted as we think we are, we have difficulty showing 
kindness. We have a hard time accepting our position and being nice to others. It's been several weeks ago, it wasn't yesterday, but I had one of those Walmart moments where the cashier is as friendly as can be. She was being oh so kind, but I was not practicing patience. And she was giving me all sorts of trivia. For instance, did you know as she scanned my bag of Granny Smith apples that there are blah, 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 number of variety of apples on the planet? I have no idea what the number was. But she informed me you could eat a different type of apple every day for 20 years and never eat the same apple. And I thought, that's really fascinating. Scan the next item. I need to go, you know. <laughs> it's difficult to have patience. It's difficult then when we're impatient to have kindness. It's, it's hard sometimes with certain people in certain situations just to, to be friendly. And yet this morning we are called to bear the fruit of kindness. Each of these fruit, we've looked at examples in Scripture at, at somebody who showed or demonstrated that particular fruit. And this morning, we're going to look at Acts 28, at a few people uh, that Paul encounters. Now, before you read those verses, and we're going to turn there in just a moment, uh, let's look at what Paul has been going through. Now, he has had the Saturday morning Walmart experience of his life for like the last few months he has made it his goal and his plan, has written to the church in Rome and told them, I've not been there yet, but I, I'm dying to get to Rome. I want to go to Rome. He's traveled all over uh, the known world, but he's yet to go to Rome. So he said, I've got one stop I need to make in Jerusalem. I'm going to go south to Jerusalem. As soon as I take care of my business in Jerusalem, I'm immediately heading to you in Rome. I just want to get to Rome. Well, when he gets to Jerusalem, his plan is to go back up north to Rome, but there are people plotting against him and accuse him uh, of, of horrible things that are, are true but should not be uh, punishable. They accuse him of, of teaching about Jesus. And that is a, a, an offense to them because they don't think that that's appropriate. They arrest him. They put him before judge after judge after judge. So while he thought his stay in Jerusalem would be short, he stays there for several months. And then finally he starts appealing to another judge and he starts slowly making his way northward until they say, fine, you can go to Rome, but we're not sending you to Rome. We're sending you to Rome to see another judge and you're not going with a caravan. You're going on a ship as a prisoner. And so as he gets on this boat, at least he's going to Rome. And so his hope is lifted a little bit, but it gets caught in this horrible storm. And in this storm, it gets shipwrecked and he's stuck on an island. And that's where we find ourselves in Acts 28. His patience has to be run thin. He must feel as if the world is against him. And now he's uncertain if he will ever get off this island and make it to Rome. And what we find is who he encounters in Acts 28, verses 1 and 2. It says, Once safely ashore, we then learn that the island was called Malta. The local people showed us extraordinary kindness. They lit a fire and took us all in, since it was raining and cold. Look down in verse 7. We, we see a little bit more in verse 7, specifically about um, the, the, the leader. Now, in the area around that place was an estate belonging to the leading man of the island named Publius, who welcomed us and entertained us hospitably for three days. Now, in this moment of absolute despair, Paul encounters those showing kindness. Now, we have no reason to believe that they were believers. We have no reason to believe that they had received the gospel, although we have every reason to believe by the time Paul left the island, they were believers. However, in this moment, when Paul needed it the most, there was someone there to show kindness. Maybe you can remember a situation where you just needed to hear an encouraging word. You just needed a little bit of support from someone, and somebody was there just to show you a little bit of kindness. Maybe you're like me, and, and you had an extremely busy summer. Now, I, I had a wonderful summer, welcomed my newborn son, but in the midst of, of losing sleep and getting things going at church and spending time with the family, my grass began to grow and began to grow and began to grow, and it was driving me crazy. It was, it was ankle high, and I like my grass bald. And I was getting ready 
one Sunday afternoon to finally get out there and, and try to get it mowed. Didn't have time, but was going to make myself sacrifice some other thing to get out there and mow some grass when I see my neighbor driving by on his riding mower mowing my grass. And I thought, I tell you what, if there was somebody who needed somebody to mow their grass, it was me. Now, I'm, I'm a little cynical. Maybe he thought, I'm tired of looking at this guy's yard. But, but in that moment, it was an act of kindness that was much needed. Maybe for you it was something a little more serious. Maybe there was a time when you were, you were down because of an illness. There was someone there to bring you soup. Maybe it was a time that you were depressed after losing a loved one and there was someone there with an encouraging word. Maybe it was a time that you were just swamped at work and there was a co-worker who came and lightened the load. Maybe there was a time when, when you just thought that nothing could go right and there was someone there to pick you up. Those moments of kindness is what we, we want from others. And the question this morning is, are we bearing that fruit? Remember, the fruit of the Spirit is not meant to receive, it's meant to give. So how can we be that helping hand? How can we bear the fruit of kindness? Well, this morning, if you have your bulletin, we've got three blanks we're going to look at as we go through what it means to bear kindness. And the first thing I want us to understand is that we bear kindness when we show grace. We bear kindness when we show grace. God has called us to be gracious to others. Now, I, I agonized over what word to use here. And there are a hundred words I could have used, and I'm very careful because I want to make sure we reflect what Scripture tells us to do. Kindness is more than just being nice. Kindness is more than just putting on a smiling face. Kindness is more than not hurting people's feelings. Kindness is more than just doing enough so that we feel good about how we've acted. No, kindness is giving above and beyond to, what, uh, to people what they don't deserve. Kindness is standing in line at Walmart and still being friendly. <laughs> kindness, is, kindness is going out of your way to help someone else. Grace, the definition of grace, is to give something that is not deserved. So if I give you grace, I'm giving you something that you have not earn. You do not deserve. And we are called to bear kindness by showing grace to others. And this is important because you and I are cynical, minimalist people when it comes to serving God. And we have in our head that if we can get by, we're doing okay. And so for us, we put a smiling face on at church. We're friendly to people. We shake hands we ask how we're doing, and we always say, fine. Everything is just how we think it should be outwardly. And, and we're good enough with that. We can be friendly and kind to people in the context of the cert a certain setting. But God has called us to be kind outside of our comfort, to give more. We have this idea that if we are just not rude, we are somehow bearing the fruit of kindness. But but the opposite of kindness is not being rude. The opposite of kindness is apathy, is doing nothing, is not interacting. Instead, God has called us to go above and beyond, to go out of our way to show kindness, to give grace to people who don't deserve it. That means those people in your life who have hurt you, who are your enemies, you are still called to be kind. That person in your life who gets under your skin and you would just like to get as far away from as you can. You are to give them what they don't deserve and show them kindness. We bear kindness when we show grace to others. And not only when we show grace above and beyond, but we do so unconditionally. Without any hesitation and with no strings attached. Now, it's not that we can be nice to people because they're nice to us. No, we are nice without anything expected in return. Let's look again at Acts 28, at the people of Malta who accepted Paul. It says, now in the area, or verse 7, now in the area uh, that the place, uh, around the place was an estate belonging to the leading man of the island named Publius, who welcomed us and entertained us hospitably for three days. Now Publius did not know who was on the boat. He did not understand who had crashed into his island. And he did not certainly have any obligation to help these people out. As a matter of fact, he could have been a cynical, hard man. He could have said, I will gladly let you stay here if you will pay from what you have on the ship. 
I will gladly let you be here if you can give something in return. Instead, what we find is, is really Paul only brought trouble. Those verses between 2 and 7, we see snakes arose uh, on the island and began biting people. This was a, a sign, certainly, that, that these were people who were harmful. And he could have said, listen, all you've done is bring cursing. I don't want to show you any kindness. Get out. And yet, without accepting anything in return, he welcomes them and entertains them for three days. Now, you and I are really good at being kind when we are being kind, receiving kindness in return. But we bear kindness when we show grace unconditionally, expecting nothing back. I, I wonder how many of us, I wonder how many of us can face our enemy and not just fake a grin, but really and truly, really and faithfully show kindness in return. There was a man who did a, a revival for us. and it's, it's the most powerful testimony I, I've ever heard. He was an, an older man. Uh, he was in his uh, 70s when he came and did the revival in Kentucky. And he had a testimony of, uh, of really a rough upbringing and background that landed him in, in a fairly serious gang, uh, a, a drug ring. And he was pretty high up, uh, was one of the, the number two leading drug dealers in his part of the country and um, was, was really a bad dude and got involved in some really scary things that involved him murdering someone else. Um, now, he wouldn't admit that he murdered someone, although he hinted at it. He said, if I admit it, then they can try me again. I've already been let off for it, and so I'm not going to tell you what I did or didn't do. But he was making it very clear he did not do what he was supposed to do. In the midst of, of his drug ring days, he, he decided he wanted to get out. And he went and he told his boss, I'm, I'm retiring, I'm taking my family, and we're leaving the country. And his boss said, you can't do that. As it works with a lot of gangs, he says, you're staying in and, and there's nothing you can do and you need to think of your family's safety if you're going to try to leave. Well, before he could do much else and get back to his family, uh, they had sent someone and hired to go and, and kill his wife and his children. And the worst part about it was, was that's actually what he was arrested for, for murdering his own family. Uh, it wasn't him, it was someone else. However, um, that's what he went on trial for. So he's sitting in a jail cell, understanding that there is someone out there who murdered his family, and he is on trial for them. And all he could do was think of how much he hated that person. As God would have it, in that jail cell, he came across a Bible, and his testimony is great, how he came to the Lord, and, and how he changed his, his life and started this evangelistic uh, ministry. And, and in doing so, one of the services, at the end of a service, a man came up to him, and he immediately recognized it was the man who had killed his family. And he said, I've heard your testimony and how you've changed, and I want to change as well. So they made a plan to meet for breakfast the next morning, and this evangelist said, I, I had so much hate in my heart, I grabbed a gun, and I took it with me to breakfast with every intention of getting even with the man who killed my family. And I don't know of a better example of kindness unconditionally as the man broke down in tears and said, I couldn't do it. And I sat there with a gun in my pocket, talking to a man and led him to Christ. Helped him to find faith, knowing that I wanted him to burn in hell eternally for killing my family, and yet showing him kindness in return. I wonder how many of us can face the person who we hate the most and give them what they don't deserve without anything expected in return. We hear a testimony like that and we think, why can't we be friendly when we're around other people? Why do we create enemies? Well, our enemies aren't anywhere near the nature of this man. How, how can we then show grace unconditionally? Or how can we keep from showing grace unconditionally? And here's the best part about kindness. is Yes, this man is a great example, but, but I think there's an even better example of kindness that we find in Scripture itself. And that is this, we bear kindness when we show grace unconditionally and reflect the character of God. Do you realize we can be kind to others because Jesus Christ was kind to us? As a matter of fact, in Romans chapter 2, Paul is writing to the Romans a list of horrible, sinful acts that people commit. And in the midst of this long list of things that people do wrong, we get to chapter 2, verse 5, when he says, But God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. It is the kindness of God 
that offers us a second chance. It is His kindness that gives us grace without conditions. It is His kindness that gives us an opportunity to change our life. But we are never more like God than when we show kindness by giving grace and mercy to others. We are never more like God than when we are showing kindness by giving grace and mercy to others. A big part of kindness is forgiveness. And this morning, there are those who have hurt you, that you are angry with, and that you never want to talk to again. And God is calling you to change your heart and offer forgiveness, mercy, grace, and show them kindness. To get along peaceably with them. At the same token, we are enemies of God. We have literally run from Him, and yet God's kindness to us has given us repentance. This morning, I wonder if instead of faking our smile, if we can genuinely be thankful and happy for the relationships God has given us and show kindness to others because of the kindness that God has given us. I wonder if we can reflect on the grace, the things that God has given us that we don't deserve, and then give grace to others. I wonder if we realize the mercy that God has given us and be merciful to others. I wonder if we can recognize the forgiveness that God has given us and therefore forgive others. And I wonder this morning if we can, we can be reminded at how great God's love is for us. That He would give us salvation through His Son. That He would show us kindness by, by bringing us to repentance. This morning as we think of kindness, it's, it's not merely uh, uh, um, something that we receive as Christians. That we hope that we will just be kind and, and friendly to one another. Instead, it's it's us going out of our way and sacrificially giving, sacrificially loving, sacrificially showing mercy and grace. This morning, as we prepare to, to have a time of invitation, I wonder if we would consider our own kindness towards others. And I wonder if we could be more like Christ and more like God by showing love, grace, mercy, and kindness. Let's pray. Father, I'm grateful and I'm thankful for your loving kindness to us. Father, we don't deserve your forgiveness. We don't deserve your grace or your mercy. And yet, Lord, you, you give it to us anyways. Lord, we've all been recipients of kindness from others. And Lord, we, we know how great it is. And Lord, help us to be people who show that in return. Lord, let us not just appease ourselves by being a smiling face, but instead let us go out of our way above and beyond to show love to those who even don't deserve it. Lord, let us give it unconditionally, not expecting anything back in return. And Lord, let that be a picture that points to the salvation you give us. Lord, this morning as we, we think of your kindness towards us, let us, let us praise you for being a God who offers salvation, offers forgiveness of our sins through your Son, Jesus Christ. Let us worship you for being a God who calls us to repent from our sin and change our ways, who calls us to live in your light. Lord, let us see that as your kindness to us and let us accept it this morning. Father, we love you and we thank you for your kindness and we pray that we would be kind in return. It's in your name we pray. Amen.